It's time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. Nigeria's first ever female combatant helicopter pilot in the Air Force, Flying Officer Tolu Lokbea Rutile, yesterday died as a result of head injuries sustained in a road accident at a Nigerian Air Force base in the northern city of Kaduna. Part of a statement by the Nigerian Air Force about her reads, until her death, Flying Officer Rutile, who was commissioned into the uh, Nigerian Air Force in September 2017 as a member of the Nigerian Defense Academy Regular Corps 64, was the first female combat helicopter pilot in service. During a short but impactful stay in the service, late Arutile, who hailed from Ife in the Jimu local government area of Kogi State, contributed significantly to the efforts to read the north central state of Ambandit and other criminal elements by flying several combat missions under Operation Gamma, IK in Mena, Niger State. I mean, very sad one. Sad one this, this morning. I mean, what's your reaction? A woman with such a stellar career ahead of her, passed on due to uh, complications she, she had from, uh, an, uh, a, 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 I think, an auto accident, a traffic, yeah. a traffic, accident. traffic road accident, accident. Head and, and she had head injuries. I mean, very painful one there. Well, we have to start off by offering our condolences to her mm. family. This is, we're deeply saddened to hear this news. It's such a, she had, as the statement said, a short and impactful um, service to her country, but she also had a short but impactful life. Oh and I hope that other people are encouraged to follow in her footsteps because her achievements at the age of 23 so young. Well, this is so desperately sad. Very painful day. Well, first, yes, I agree with you. It's very sad. Our condolences to our family, uh, to the uh, Nigerian Army, uh, Nigerian military. She was of the Air Force uh, uh, branch. And also to the people of uh, uh, Ife in Ijumu. Uh, local government area of uh, Kogi State, because at the time she was uh, decorated in uh, just about a year ago, uh, there was a lot of excitement, and Nigeria was having its first combatant helicopter pilot, and then you know uh, it has uh, ended this way a road accident. Um, going further, I would like to suggest that the uh, military authorities should investigate the circumstances of that accident. I'm not alleging foul play. I'm just saying that the circumstances should be investigated. Is it possible that there are lessons that could be learned from it? Because the reports indicate that the uh, accident occurred within the vicinity of the Nigeria Air Force Base in Kaduna. So what exactly happened? So that, you know, certain, maybe certain protocols can be put in place so that this kind of thing does not happen in the future. Now, in terms of what she represents, in 2011, uh, President Gulag Jonathan approved that female combatants for the first time should be admitted into the regular combatant training program of the Nigerian Defense Academy. And that year, 20, uh, 20 uh, female combatants uh, enrolled in the uh, Nigerian Defense Academy for the first time. It was not the first time that you have female soldiers within the army. After all, we had uh, Brigadier General Kale, yeah, uh, uh, rising, mother. Yes, rising to the top uh, within the military. But she was not a regular combatant. You know, but for the first time in 2011, we now had regular combatants. And I recall that, uh, you know, uh, during the uh, matriculation ceremony of that set, uh, you know, the uh, major part, one major paragraph in President Jonathan's uh, address was that he was looking forward to a day when a woman would become... Yeah, one of the service chiefs mm. in Nigeria. Yes. And that was the expectation. And, yeah. you know, so she represented a lot of hope. Uh, she and our other colleagues uh, who had joined our program since 2011 uh, became some kind of symbol in terms of uh, that popular say, what a woman can do, what a man can do, a woman can also, can also, do. Can also do. However, in 2017, mm. there was a re review of the national defense policy. And recommendation 19 of that okay. uh, uh, policy, dealing with harmonized service conditions, okay. recommended that the uh, Nigerian military will no longer admit females uh, into the regular combatant uh, course. Now, I don't have information on what eventually happened with that, yeah. whether it was approved by President okay. Buhari or not. Okay. But I think that, you know, from what we have seen in other places, Israel, India, Japan, you know, 
uh, women should not be excluded yes. uh, from, from achieving so. their potentials. Yes. And unfortunately, this uh, lady has died. But from what we have heard about what she's been able to do yes. and her contributions, it shows that, look, women can rise to any level, and do well. in, including the military services. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, like you said, investigation. Second. We're going straight to the second story. Technology entrepreneur Fahim Saleh, who was the chief executive officer of uh, former bike hailing app GoCada, was on Tuesday, uh, July 14, 2020, found dead and his body dismembered in his New York apartment. Salah's body was found headless and dismembered inside his luxury Lower East Side apartment. I think that should be in Manhattan, which he bought in 2019. Uh, the body of the 33-year-old was discovered by his sister, who became worried after not hearing from him in a day. This is another very sad one. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just literally a very sad story this morning. This is somebody I know particularly, and this is why this hits home, you know. I know the company Gokada. I know his passionate appeal when, um, you know, the regulations came forth and, and Gokada had to seize business in Nigeria. Uh, I know his co-founder. So this really hits home for me. You know, uh, Salem had to relocate to New York uh, after the regulation came on ride-hailing bike services and the likes in Lagos due to the new laws uh, put in place by the Ministry of Transport in Lagos. Uh, investigations are still on about this. They saw a camera footage of somebody actually following him to his apartment on the seventh floor, and the next thing he, he fell down. Maybe they shot him or something. And they saw an electric saw close to him that was still plugged, pretty much, uh, that, that was used to dismember his body. Very sad one. A uh, great guy. He came to Nigeria to create a lot of jobs. He had some money. He wanted to try it out in Nigeria, entrepreneurially, uh, uh, in the entrepreneurship uh, sector set up Gokada, got a lot of investment. It was a lifeline for a lot of young Nigerians uh, without jobs. A lot of graduates employed on the scheme and the likes. And, and he had a great dream. He had a great vision. I mean, uh, Fahim Saleh was a man always bustling with a lot of energy and life. He saw the potential. He was in Nigeria and he's from Bangladesh. But he saw the great potential in this country and he wanted to do something. But Investigations will go on. We'll see how this pans out in the coming days. But this is really very sad. And this, this hits home to me because it's somebody, you know, I know, I have seen, especially if you do things around the tech sector in this country. So it's quite very sad. It's just appalling. Yet another family we need to offer our condolences to this morning. I mean, what appalling violence. I do hope that his killers are apprehended and convicted. It's such a shame, such a... Brilliant entrepreneur. It's tragic. May so rest in perfect peace and may God comfort his family. This is And most importantly, awful. the Gokada family in Nigeria. Most importantly? Most importantly, more than his, his biological no, family? His family and the Gokada family. Now, you know I said the Gokada... No, his biological family comes first. But you know what I said the Gokada family in Nigeria? The people he had impacted their lives, that, that they created Absolutely. jobs from. Very painful. That's all on the news headlines. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have the trio of Rosa Sajiri, Michael Wilson, and Aaron Akirajala to give us updates on Africa and global business and COVID-19. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Our ever-dependable Rotus Oduri is here now to give us the Africa business update. Good morning, Rotus. Over to you. Good morning. Morning, Rotus. Hello, Rotus. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, I want to also... Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, uh, Tundu. Good morning, Rufai. also want to echo Rufai's uh, comments there on the tragic loss of uh, the CEO of Kokada. I met him at a press release here in Nigeria. It's really... Quite shocking. Uh, but we kick off with um, uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, they've released uh, a GSI, a global, uh, in, um, in global Standing Instruction Guidelines. You can see the individuals there in uh, parentheses at the bottom. This is supposed to assist commercial banks in retrieving uh, funds uh, for lo from loan defaulters. So what essentially this is, is these guidelines, if we take a look at the objectives, let's move to the GSI objectives, um, they're supposed to improve credit repayment costs 
agriculture, reduce non-performing loans, and also create a watch list as a, a, that for consistent loan defaulters. So um, this emerged from the last meeting with the Bankers Committee, which of course is headed by the uh, chief executives of commercial banks of Nigeria and chaired by the central bank. The central bank wants to assist these banks in being able to recover funds from loan defaulters. We can also look at the affected accounts, and this now ties to the first uh, image where we saw the individuals in parentheses. So this is for individuals, though, for the accounts that qualify, savings accounts, current accounts, domiciliary accounts, investment deposit accounts that include Naira, dollars, euros, other foreign exchange, and then e-wallets. The central bank is in getting the assistance of NIBs, which is the Nigeria Interbank Settlement uh, System. NIBS, of course, facilitates the electronic payment structure in Nigeria. Uh, and, you know, if you're using a bank card, if you're, you know, taking money from the ATM, NIBS can see all of that. So, essentially, the central bank is allowing uh, commercial banks to be able to go into any related accounts to retrieve uh, money that is owed to them from a, a loan defaulter. It is only, though, for principal and interest. It does not include any extra charges whatsoever. But this is a, it's supposed to reduce non-performing loans, supposed to include, improve the credit payment, um, uh, repayment culture. But there's also something to be said for the need to incentivize Nigerians to want to pay back their loans. I remember when I got my first credit card as a college student in Houston, and I was very, you know, steadfast in wanting to pay back my loans, my credit card loans, so I could get a low interest rate on a mortgage or get, you know, um, uh, higher uh, funds if I want to borrow next time. That is happening in Nigeria, though, I must say that we've got a credit, we've got three credit bureaus here. We've got credit reports for Nigerians, um, but it's on the regulatory side where if you pay more, uh, sorry, if you pay your loans back on time, your amounts will increase over time. But they need to sell that. It needs to be sold to Nigerians. The other aspect of this is that we don't have uh, interest rate incentives, at least for now. I still, we still have a high interest rate environment. But by and large, this is a good move from the Central Bank of Nigeria in trying to reduce non-performing loans and make sure that banks now have a, a wider capacity to take funds that are being owed to them from loan defaults. So matter, no matter what account you have, they'll be able to go in there and take it out. Uh, we move on to Uganda. Uh, MTN, Uganda is an MTN are trying to uh, renegotiate MTN's license. MTN in Uganda has a had a 20-year license, which they initiated in 1998. The license expired in October of 2018. Since that time, MTN has been using six-month renewals to continue to operate in Uganda. Uganda is asking MTN to list on their stock exchange, and this creates, uh, you know, birth another you know debate about whether or not you should be forcing a company to list on your exchange. As you know, they've listed on the Nigerian stock exchange, although it wasn't an IPO, an initial public offering. They were just listed existing shares that were owned by um, shareholders in Nigeria. Another thing. So the the, the conversation is with capitalism. If your uh, market is attractive enough, you don't need to ask a company to list on your exchange. They'll just do it. Another thing is that African stock markets, their market caps are pretty small. Let's take a look at this African uh, stock markets, uh, select African stock markets by market cap. You'll see that Uganda in dollar terms is, and this is just a simple bar chart I put together, in, and, and Uganda in dollar terms only amounts to $4 billion in market cap. The market capitalization, you, you multiply the share price of every single stock on an exchange and multiply by every single company, and you get your full market capitalization. So in dollar terms, Uganda is only about $4 billion. Ghana, where MTN is also listed on the Ghanaian stock exchange, is $10.4 billion. Nairobi, New, yeah, MTN is not on the Nairobi stock exchange. I just picked them just for this sake of comparison. Their market cap is in $17 billion, and then Nigeria there uh, is the biggest one at $33 billion, I think about 12 trillion naira market cap. Now let's move to the next slide. If you include the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, I mean, look at that, just look. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange has a market cap of $1 trillion, with a T, $1 trillion. When you now include Johannesburg, and you, you can't even see um, um, Uganda on this, on this graph, they're barely there, and you compare these other, other markets. So if a big company like MCN, which of course is listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, that's where you want to go. The flip side of the argument is that Johannesburg Stock Exchange didn't get here overnight. They had to grow over time. So yes, MTN, you should list your shares on Uga in Uganda Stock Exchange because you're a big company, add some depth to the market and allow them to grow over time. Then the flip side to that argument is, look, uh, you know, I'm already providing a service. I'm a telecommunications company. Your, your hospitals, your schools, you use internet that I provide. So why are you making me list? Well, okay, you're not listing here as a charity. You are doing it for, you're making, you have a business here, you're making money off us, you might as well list. So th those are the back and forth arguments as to whether it's going to happen. Um, 
MTN is paying a hundred million US dollars to Uganda for the license to extend. So I think they will, in the end, probably agree to do it. Well, some questions for you, Rotos. You recall that MTN, when MTN was required to list on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, there was some back and forth about how that was done. Uh, in this particular case in Uganda, nothing has been resolved yet. So will MTN agree? Because uh, I know that their license has now been extended uh, for another period of, uh, is it 12 years or eight years? Uh, since the original license that they were given. So the right. question is, would they agree? They will. If you look at their market share, MTN is a, is a leader in Uganda, 51% market share compared to their competitors. They've got about 12.6 million subscribers. So they, the money they make there is decent. I believe that they will actually um, agree to it um, because, I mean, they're doing business there and they, they have to. They'll be compelled to do so. They might repeat what they did in Nigeria where they won't, it won't be an IPO. They'll just list uh, existing shares. We'll see how it works out. But I think uh, with regard to the uh, CBS uh, Global standing instruction. I agree with you. It's a welcome development. But what is the guarantee uh, that these banks will not try to uh, play games or sidestep in terms of, for example, if they make mistakes uh, with regard to uh, uh, debtors, uh, loan defaulters? Are there any guarantees that those loan defaulters uh, can also be protected in a sense? And then do you suspect that there will be a run on the banks? Because if you, are, you, you will now be using BBN and TIN uh, to monitor uh, loans and all of that, some people may just decide to uh, step back from the banking system. Is it likely? Well, I don't think so, because if you step out of the banking system, how do you operate? How do you pay for food, transportation? How do you, you know, you know, you know practice you know, your financial you know, operations in Nigeria. That's why NIBS is there to supervise everything and make sure that they can take our money that's owed. Uh, so I don't think there will be a run on the bank. To so your pre first question as to how to make sure the banks follow the rules, um, the CBN's guidelines are very strict. It's nothing more than principal and interest, no extra fees. If there's an error, there are electronic records of this, and the error should be spotted by the, because the person whose money has been debited, they'll know what's been taken out. If there's anything extra beyond principal and interest, it will be noted, flagged, and hopefully refunded to the particular customer. Unfortunately, Rotas, we don't have time for your South Africa story. Oh, that's fine. Tomorrow, then. Yeah. We've got to move on now for a global business update. Joining us is Michael Wilson from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. I'll take you to uh, Japan first, and uh, stocks there rose. Um, and this, I think, will be a continuing narrative throughout the day. Um, optimism about a swift resumption to, op uh, to economic growth globally, uh, and, uh, and also um, the, the, the fact that a, 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 the vaccine may be closer to, to coming to fruition. I have to say I'm cynical about that. I don't know. I think it would probably take quite a long time. But the Nikkei, anyway, up about 1.5%. And, um, percent. Um, and uh, the other risky assets like, like Japan stocks and good ones, they didn't used to be, but they are now. Um, this is the U.S. biotech firm Moderna, Inc. Uh, said it's experimental. Coronavirus vaccine showed it was safe uh, in, a, in an early stage study. Um, very mixed day, really, for stocks yesterday throughout the rest of the world. Health concerns to the forefront again. WHO saying that uh, too many countries were heading in the wrong direction. Uh, and there's certainly a big concern that many parts of the world are actually going backwards in, in the way that they're approaching the, the pandemic. Um, Hong Kong, for example, has got new restrictions in Australia, which uh, had some very strong retail sales. You remember a couple of weeks ago, Victoria has, its state of Victoria has paused its reopening and Florida has reclosed um, bars and restaurants and so on. And Philadelphia and Florida and Philadelphia will also ban large um, public events until February yeah, that's a long time away, uh, even even in the way that things move um, these days. In addition to all the health concerns, the usual um, noise between the United States and China, this time Secretary of State in the United States, Mike Pompeo, um, saying that China's territorial claims in the South China Sea are completely unlawful. Tit for tat, Chinese government claim that the U.S. is an intentionally distorting the facts. So there you go. Interesting, of course, that... Uh, the Trump administration appears to have moved slightly, I think, that certainly the phase one negotiations of trade are going ahead. I'm getting the idea that President Trump does not want to uh, rattle too many cages right now before the election in November. I could be wrong, but that's where we are at the moment. Saying yesterday that the biggie, of course, is the reporting season this week. Yesterday, it was uh, JP Morgan, Citigroup and Wells Fargo. Um, between them, 
They have got $27 billion set aside for bad debt provisions. And we're going to hear from Goldman Sachs, Bank of America and Morgan Stanley today. Overall, uh, the results are not as bad as people have expected, but not very good either. But you would expect that uh, from the banks. So Elon Musk, he of Tesla fame, tweeted one word yesterday, wow. Why did he do that? Well, because uh, a forecaster said that, uh, predicted a share price, get this, uh, for Tesla of $2,332 per share. Now, that's a lot. It was a lot when it was 939. That was the prediction before. And you remember a year ago, this was the company that was actually under sufferance about uh, bankruptcy a year ago. And look at it now. Um, uh, it, now, wh wh what we're seeing here is the fact that Tesla really is not a car company. It's an IT company. Um, it's, uh, it, it's into power supply, probably wants to dominate the world as far as that's concerned. Certainly, it's developing batteries. And it's a disruptor, basically, in every industry that it actually finds itself in now. Uh, what we're seeing here, other people would say, you've heard of a meltdown. How about a melt up? In other words, these are investors scrambling to get in at this kind of rapid rise in a share price. Will it all end in tears? Will it be a bubble? Could be. I'll let you know. Uh, UK latest GDP figures yesterday were marginally disappointing. They weren't that impressive. Um, again, you know, I would say to that, well, so what? Of course, neither was the economy very impressive during May. Um, maybe things will get very slightly better, but uh, who knows? It was a slight improvement on, it was a minus 24%, a slight improvement on April's minus 24 now half percent. Um, and the OBR, the uh, Office for Budget Responsibility, our sort of um, government spending and tax watchdog, uh, said that tax rises and spending cuts will have to arise. Now, Huawei, here we go again. So China's ambassador to the UK has said that Britain's decision to ban the telecoms giant Huawei from its telecom systems uh, by 2027 is disappointing and wrong. Um, the UK has decided to strip that equipment out of the system by 2027. No new purchases of Huawei equipment beyond the end of the year. And it follows um, sanctions that the United States, of course, has put on Huawei's products. And the US president said he welcomed the UK decision calling Huawei unsafe. Finally, commodities. Now, we've got OPEC meeting today uh, and tomorrow, OPEC plus as well. Um, been a bit of a rise. Again, as I keep saying to you, nothing to do with OPEC. It's all about inventories. There was a sharp drop in, uh, in US inventories, and that sort of pushed the price. Well, it's given a slight impact uh, to the price, but we'll wait to see, uh, if you like that kind of thing, what OPEC actually says today. That's your global outlook. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I have a question about Huawei. Obviously, we've all known for the past few months that this was inevitably going to happen. I think everybody read the writing on the wall. But is that Chinese firm still building the nuclear power station at Hinkley Point? Because I fail to see how, if Huawei is unsafe for telecoms, why you would allow an unsafe power, an unsafe government to build your nuclear stations? Yeah, uh, and I think there's a lot of discussion about that, and you can expect more discussion about whether that's actually going to take place or not. The much larger uh, share of that building is being undertaken by France and Framatome, the, uh, the, the French nuclear authority, and it was also been seen as a joint venture. It, th there are two things about this. A, Huawei may be forbidden to take part in that. Who knows? Don't know about that at the moment. There is also a possibility of ring, of ring fencing their influence in the uh, in, in the actual building and also the operation. I think the idea is that there would be a watchdog here that would operate, that, that would um, oversee the operation of it. Um, as far as the technology is concerned, that I suspect there's going to be a lot of debate about that. But but certainly these are these are opening battles, and it's important to remember that this has hit Huawei as well, and they have been they 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 are now trying to massively uh, use other Chinese manufacturers of semiconductors and also start manufacturing their own ever since those sanctions from the United States began to apply. So, yes, I think that's a, a very, a very valuable um, point to take into the future. And I suspect discussions are taking place about that even as we speak. OK. Uh, oh, you will, okay. Hi, I, I, I just quickly, you know, wanted to talk about uh, Elon Musk and uh, Tesla and the need for government to play a major part in entrepreneurship. I'm, I'm sure you remember when uh, President Obama then had to give Elon Musk that loan to start off 
Uh, he was he was pushed around for that. I remember Mitt Romney during the campaign then saying, uh, you're giving people like Tesla and Cylindrica money to do business. That's not the business of the future. But you can see what Tesla is yielding today. I just want you to speak to, to that thought about government, you know, being part of the story and the journey of entrepreneurs. Anyway, Tesla has paid that money back with interest. Yeah, I mean, I uh, personally, I think government should stay out of commercial things, provided that the commercial companies are operating within the law. I think that the, what we would call in this country the dead hand of government has always failed when it starts to get involved because politicians know nothing about business. Uh, Musk whatever you think about him, is creating an incredible company here. It may well be a bubble, but don't, don't get it wrong. It's not, about, it's not about making those cars you're seeing. It's actually about, be it about IT, it's about power, it's about electricity, and it's about electricity retention. And quite honestly, if, you, if, you, if you're starting a company that size, if it's helping the United States become completely independent from other power imports, and also providing thousands of jobs, then I don't see what there is to argue with, unfortunately. I mean, government can, can say what it likes, but we've moved on. I mean, we have moved on rapidly with something like Tesla. Just as I said, a year ago, there were discussions about its possible bankruptcy. And look at it now. Will it be a bubble? Could well be. But I think government should probably stay out of the way. I'm certain they do not want to get involved in this. And, uh, you know, why should they? They, if, if they want to buy into the company, they can. If they want to buy corporate bonds in it, they can. Um, should they let the company take the risk as they are doing right now? Yes, they should. Thank well, you, Mr. Thank Robert. you very much, uh, Michael Wilson. Joining us now is Aaron Akirajada with the COVID-19 pandemic update. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Tindu. Always looking lovely and regular as ever. So and kind. Doctor, yeah. good morning. And good morning, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, good morning. Hey, uh, thank you for helping me amplify my thoughts every morning. <laughs> oh, without a pleasure, always my pleasure there. Now, getting straight into how things are actually playing out in terms of COVID-19, who actually visited into Africa this morning? Because as a matter of fact, looking at the figures coming in as of this morning, it is the fact that Africa has actually crossed the 600,000 mark. Uh, all right, as of this, as at 6 a.m. this morning, it was 609. Right now, it's been updated to 612,586 with 13,519 deaths. Without a doubt, the southern part of Africa is still taking the cake of which South Africa still accounts for now rising to almost 45 percent of what we're seeing in Africa. So now let's actually get it. Let's try to break it down in numbers, talking about the infections in Africa. Moving on, moving on to the first floor, you can actually see that South Africa right now, by the end of the day, South Africa would have close to about 300,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19, followed by Egypt. But the, but the disparity there is the fact that Egypt has had more deaths than South Africa, although South Africa has had more infections than Egypt. Some are still attributing it to the fact that South Africa has been going on rampant testing. Nigeria is third, Ghana is fourth, Algeria are fifth. Now, Looking at what um, the World Health Organization is saying is the fact that some countries are having it better than others. The, the likes of Gambia, the Gambia, Seychelles, Eritrea have the lowest cases of COVID-19 in the entirety of Africa. Now let's actually move into the next region now. By this particular circles, the red circles we can actually see there on the screen, the larger the circle, the larger the infections in those countries. You can see South Africa has the biggest circle, followed by Egypt and Nigeria. We have places like Ga um, um, Ka Ghana, Cameroon, Tunisia, Morocco, some hotspots in Africa. Moving on to the next one, in numbers, breaking it down, without a doubt, the most affected region at the moment is still Gauteng in South Africa, with over 100 thousand cases, followed by Greater Accra, then Lagos State, which we are seeing the rise in numbers, then Grand Abidjan, then Yaoundé also moving on. Now, let's actually move on to what is really going on in terms of lockdown, because lockdown has been what has been reintroduced, not introduced, reintroduced as a means and a measure to try to curb the spread of COVID-19 around the world. We've, we've known that instead of countries going into major lockdowns right now, regions are going into lockdowns. At the moment, we are seeing some regional lockdowns like what we are experiencing in the southwest of Victoria, in Melbourne, Australia. At the moment, South Africa are also in a lockdown. I think the only country in the world right now that are in a full-scale lockdown. Still going back to before this, before getting to South Africa, of course, in Asia also, we are also seeing the Bihar region in 
India also going into major lockdown. In the UK, of course, Leicester City are still debating whether the lockdown is useful or not. And also in the Catalonia region in Spain, we are seeing a major lockdown. Now, since you push out South Africa there, let's actually break it down concerning what is happening in South Africa. Like we've said in previous time, massive testing is going on, but the cases keep on rising. And it's quite worrisome. Western Cape, Easter Cape, and KwaZulu-Natal are seeing major, major rises in cases of COVID-19 in Africa. And it's quite worrisome and the government are still insisting, how do they balance this between locking the state down and also trying to keep the economy buoyant? We know South Africa are majorly in the red in terms of economy at the moment, and it's, it's, it's a touch-and-go thing, and it's, it's one hurdle that they have been trying to navigate, almost like riding the back and chewing chewing gum at the same time. Let's see how things actually go with them. But before we actually go, now, talking about vaccine, vaccine is always is the major silver bullet in trying to curb and probably banish COVID-19. At the moment, we are having Moderna leading the charge in terms of vaccine around the world. We know other people have, we spoke about vaccines two weeks ago and the people leading the charge in vaccine, but Moderna in the US have gone the farthest right now. And as a matter of fact, they've entered some human trial phases and they are saying that by the 27th of this month, they will be testing 30,000 people and they are hoping that very soon, maybe the, by the autumn or by the fall, we'll get to see these things in full production. Moderna are really leading the charge we know that a university in Russia are also doing great things in terms of clinical trials for a vaccine, and they are not sure of when it will be released to the public or when it will go into commercial use. But Moderna are the farthest right now. The America drug company, or the American pharmaceutical company, are really looking like they can crack this. President Donald Trump is hinging so much on this. Dr. Fauci has celebrated what is really happening with Moderna and what they are really doing with the National Institute of Health. Also, because most of all these vaccine companies are actually partnering with maybe either universities or institutes of health, like we've seen with Oxford University and also AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca in the UK and Oxford University in the UK are doing continuous trials in South Africa and also Brazil. So let's hope that these things are on timetable and certainly we might be having a, um, a vaccine for the virus before the end of the year. But before we go, quite troubling is the fact that there has been a lot of talk about doctors, frontline workers, and how things are being managed. Lagos State have been accusing doctors of being insensitive, but the um, Amnesty International has brought out these statistics from Amnesty International, and they are saying these are the number of people that have died, frontline workers and doctors in the world. 3,000 is the number of people that have died. You can actually see that in South Africa, six has died, Zimbabwe, one, Mauritius, one, Ghana, two, Algeria, seven. 111 in Egypt, 19 in Yemen. You can, you can see the numbers there. Brazil, 351 doctors and frontline workers have died. In the UK, 540, which accounts for one of the highest, alongside Russia, 545. So now the question is this. It's almost like the devil at the deep blue sea. These frontline workers are claiming that they are not being looked after properly and they're not being equipped properly. And some people are saying, it might be a little bit insensitive. This is not the time to begin to go on strike because we know that um, places in Africa like Nigeria, Syria, alone, Kenya are going into major strikes in this period. As a matter of fact, frontline workers also in France um, were protesting some months ago. So it's really tough right now. How do they balance these things is left to be seen. Well, Aaron, uh, yes. on the question of vaccines, yes. uh, Dr. Tedros Gabriel Jesus, yeah. the uh, head of the WHO, yeah. says that finding a cure is the only way out. And that cure is getting a vaccine. Mm. And again, according to uh, uh, Dr. Gabriel Jesus, there are about 21 trials yeah. uh, going on around the world. So it's uh, heartening to hear that Moderna is going ahead. But we must also note the efforts that, that have been made by Sinovac, which is this Chinese company, uh, which is now conducting phase three trials. Mm -hmm. And then the UK-based AstraZeneca is also conducting phase three Trial. uh, trials. Yeah. And then you cited the example of the research effort uh, from the uh, Moscow Medical University. Yeah. Uh, but the only problem with that is that we're told that only 38 persons yeah. were involved in that trial and that it doesn't go far enough. Yeah. But what we've seen is that you know various countries, the US, France, Brazil, uh, China, the UK, they're involved in this race to find a cure yes and i think that the only question that we need to raise in that regard is the need for 
global solidarity, Without a doubt. which is something that uh, the WHO has also emphasized. On the question of the lockdowns that we have seen in uh, parts of China, in uh, South Korea, in uh, you know, uh, Spain, India. northern Spain, yeah. which we refer to, and in India, uh, also in uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and all those. Maybe Nigerian can learn a lesson from that. Yes. Early uh, June, we were told that 60% of the cases in Nigeria could be located in about 20 local governments. First week of July, we were told that that had been uh, revised to 18 local governments. What would have expected? That if we follow policy, we make the right choices. By now, those local governments that are the major positivity rate centers in Nigeria will have been locked down. But there has been no follow-up. So the briefing by the uh, presidential task force in Nigeria should you not stop at giving us information. We should still follow up consequential action you have a point that there. is in the best interest you have of a the point people there. of Nigeria. Yes. Thank you so much. Aaron. Always a pleasure.